Good morning, everyone. My name is Pastor Will, one of the servants here at New Life Press. And as you already know, we are concluding our missions month, and we'll be looking at a well-known passage in Romans chapter 10, where we see the Apostle Paul encouraging the church to find hope and confidence in the plan of God for salvation, but also as a church and individuals to feel this compelling gospel drive to deliver the message of the gospel to people who don't know who Christ is. And so let's take a look at what that may look like for us today by reading Romans chapter 10, verses 14 to 21. So please give your undivided attention to the reading of God's holy word, starting with verse 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? And it is as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have, for their voice has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who do not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. This is God's word for us. And as we continue our missions month and our series on missions, I, I want to take a look at what Paul says in the verses I just read regarding the necessity of evangelism. The necessity of evangelism. The requirement, the necessity of preaching. And I just have three simple points as we look at Paul's quite theologically developed argumentation, his perspective, his way that he wants to, in his typical Pauline way, argue for the necessity of evangelism, even for 21st century believers like you and me today. His, his exhortation, his requirements, his theological points all are relevant for believers like you and me today in a postmodern Western world. And so as we look at these verses, I just want to consider three things. Three things about his exhortation, his encouragement, his theological compelling argumentation for evangelism. First, we'll look at the logic of evangelism. Quite simple, actually. Secondly, we'll look at the diagnostic, the diagnostic of evangelism. How do we have an understanding of what the real core issue is regarding people who reject Christ? And then thirdly, we'll look at the grace or the heart of evangelism, the openness of evangelism. So let's look at the logic, secondly, the diagnostic, and then third, the heart. But first, let's consider together the Apostle Paul's logic of evangelism. And he's not trying to trick us. He's very plain and clear in the logic of why we need to have beautiful feet and why you and I need to bring and deliver the good news to those who are lost. But I want to start off by giving you the context of these verses because if you didn't know and if you've never read the Bible or the book of Romans, Romans chapter 9 through 11, in fact, are some of the most difficult, the greatest theological chapters of the Bible. But they're most difficult to interpret and to understand. It's probably maybe the top three chapters in the Bible to really understand the, the main point, and scholars have poured countless hours and energy into this. So I'm going to try to explain a little bit, just a little bit of the context before we get into this idea of beautiful feet. Because what Paul is doing in Romans chapter 9 through 11 is essentially explaining God's sovereignty, his great grand purpose in salvation. And he's explaining this to Jewish people and saying, well, now the church makes up not just Jewish people, but Gentiles, and Paul is saying, let me recount Israel's history. Let me show you God's great love and mercy and sovereignty. And I'm going to show you the place of Israel in this grand history, this really big narrative of how God works in history to bring a people to himself. 
So the Apostle Paul says God works in Genesis and he'll end on Revelation. And right there in the middle, you have the history of Israel. And he's writing to his Jewish brethren and saying, let me show you. Let me explain to you the importance of Israel and what God has done in this nation to expand the gospel to the ends of the earth. And that's essentially Romans 9 through 11, the doctrine of election, the doctrine of God's sovereignty, the doctrine of salvation. And in chapter 10, he gets to this point and he's trying to explain at the end of the day, when you think about salvation, there are only two ways, two ways that you can argue for and two ways that are out there in the world. Two ways meaning that people either say, I could get to God on my own resources or I could get to God by his loving grace for me. He uses this word righteousness, and that basically means, how do I get right with God? God is holy. I'm sinful. How do I get right with God? And he says out there at the end of the day are only two approaches that people have to get right with God, two paths, two righteousnesses. And he says the one way to go is to say, I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to be moral. I'm going to use my own efforts and resources, my own morality, my own good deeds, and I'm going to establish my own righteousness. I'm going to make myself right with God by my own resources and strength. That's Pharisaism. That's legalism. That's self-righteousness. That's how one way that many people, apart from Christ, try to get right with God. And Paul says, but the real way, the only way, the right way, is not establishing your own righteousness, but the only way you can get right with God is if God makes you right with him. And he sends his son Jesus by his love and his grace to die for your sins and mine. And if by faith we receive Christ, we receive an alien righteousness, a righteousness outside of us, a righteousness that we can only receive but not achieve, a righteousness that we can accept and get but never establish, procure, or garner, or establish ourselves. If you could receive this righteousness of Jesus who did all the work, fulfilled the Ten Commandments, and did what you and I can't do, then we can be right with God. He says there's only two righteousnesses. He says in the beginning of chapter 10, verses 3 to 4, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God, the one that comes from Christ, and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So Paul says, there are only two ways to go. Friends, did you know that especially, and I'm speaking more towards those who grew up in the church and think they know theology and understand the doctrines of grace. Did you know that the Bible and myself, I actually believe in a works salvation, a salvation by works. Did you know that? I believe that you can only go to heaven through works. The difference is I believe in a salvation of works, but those works are not mine. They're Jesus. He completed and did all the work that I couldn't do. That's why somebody had to be obedient to the Ten Commandments. Somebody had to pay the penalty for my sin. Somebody had to die on the cross. Somebody had to live the perfect life and die the perfect death and be resurrected again. So I believe thoroughly in a salvation by works, but it's not my works, it's Jesus's. And this is a question, which is our passage. If there's only one true way to get right with God, if there's only one righteousness, a works of a salvation by works that is Jesus's, how can I get that for myself? How can I get right with God? How can I receive the gospel? How can I get the perfect work of Jesus credited to my account by faith? How can I get these wonderful blessings? That's what Paul is trying to explain here. And he says, this is how you get it. Verse 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's how you get it. Confess through their mouth and believe in your heart. And then in verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Call on the name of the Lord. So how can I get this alien righteousness, this gospel for me? It's not by trying to live a good life, but it's to receive the perfect life. It says there, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, Call on Jesus to help you, to save you. Call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. And this is Paul's logic. How can anyone call on the name of Jesus? How can anyone call on the name? Here's the logic. How can they call on Christ? And Paul in our verses gives us four questions in verses 14 to 15, and he's just breaking it down simply. How can anyone who doesn't know Jesus call on the name of Christ? And I'm going to state this sort of positively, but there's four questions that get to his logic. I'm going to take the questions, and I'm going to state it a little bit differently. And this is his logic. 
No one can call on Christ if they don't believe on Christ. And they can't believe on Christ if they can't hear about Christ. And they can't hear about Christ unless someone preaches Christ. And there's no one to preach Christ and someone is sent to preach Christ. How beautiful are the feet who bring good news. It's not anything too insightful. How can they call on him if they don't believe? How can they believe if they don't hear? How can they hear unless someone tells them about it? How can someone tell them about it unless someone is sent to do it? How beautiful are the feet who bring good news? Now, this is a silly example. And actually, just sort of bear it with me, but at least for those who are watching the young uh, New Life kids or New Life youth, it's the same kind of idea of anything that you want to just sell to people. And a simple example is maybe Girl Scout cookies. And I go Google this, and still the number one Girl Scout cookie is Thin Mints. And so the basic sort of logic that Paul applies here that's saying Thin Mints are the number one greatest tasting Girl Scout cookie. How can I get everyone to experience the joy of eating a Thin Mint? And it's the same sort of logic. They can't actually buy the Thin Mint unless they believe that they taste good. They can't believe that it tastes good unless they hear about it and all the wonderful flavors that it has. They can't hear about these wonderful cookies unless someone actually goes and tells them. How beautiful are the feet of Girl Scouts? It's the same logic, friends. And that's why he says we need beautiful feet. The world needs beautiful feet. Friends, let me think about this with you. Do you ever think or wonder why this famous verse in the church, how beautiful are the feet, why, are there, why does it say beautiful feet? Now, he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7, but why beautiful feet? Because when you think about it, it's preaching the gospel, evangelizing. Why wasn't it the beautiful voice? How beautiful is the voice? How beautiful is the melody? How poetic are the words? But instead, he says, how beautiful are the feet? I would even go further to say feet oftentimes, if we're honest, are not associated with beauty, especially in a Western culture. Usually we associate feet with things that are ugly or smelly. They have broken toenails. They have all bruises on their toes. They have toe jam. You have all these games that you play at retreats and fellowship times, and some of the punishments are dealing with your toes and their feet. Take off the dirty sock, and you smell something really nasty. So in our culture, we associate feet with something that's negative. But why does the Bible say beautiful feet? Now, I even try to Google this and research this a bit. How do different cultures understand feet? But there wasn't much out there. In fact, what came up was this one article that said, Meghan Markle has the most beautiful feet in the world. Emma Watson came a close second, and they said she has near-perfect feet. And so I looked at these Google images of their feet, and you know what? They just look like feet. They're still kind of ugly. This is unattractive, but why is it that it says beautiful feet? And this is why. Because he's hearkening back in Isaiah chapter 52 to a time when Israel, because of the punishment of God, was kicked out of their home by the Babylonian exile. They're living in a foreign land. They're dying to come back home and to worship in their own place. They're out there for years. They're homesick, the Israelites are hurting, they're suffering, they're longing to come back home, and at one point, they're allowed to come back to their home, and who delivers the message? These people that come over the mountains. And then the Israelites, when they see these messengers coming, they know what they're going to say. It's time to come home. It's time to come back. And even before they hear the message to say, you can go home now, they see the messengers, and they're saying, how beautiful is uh, that sight? How beautiful are those feet? Because what the Apostle Paul and Isaiah are trying to say is that before the people hear the message, they see the beauty of the messenger. It's a beautiful sight. Feet that bring a message of peace. Feet that bring a message of hope. Feet that bring a message of love. Something the world so desperately needs here today. That is the Apostle Paul's logic. How they can they ever call in the name of Jesus if they never heard about him? How, they, how can they ever believe in him unless they hear about Jesus? How can they hear about Jesus unless someone shares about Jesus? And how can anyone share about Jesus unless you're sent 
like missionary Esther Cho, or missionary Dave and Julie, missionaries Elder Chuck and Nikki, missionaries who are there in Southeast Asia and Cambodia? How can they hear unless people like that are sent? How can your neighbor across a street hear about the gospel unless you have beautiful feet? How can your coworker who's struggling much worse than you at the workplace, how can they know about Jesus and have the resources to face adversity with calm, cool, and collected reserve? How can they have that unless you have beautiful feet? How can the parents of your kids at school during the play date, a mom who's stressed with COVID and sending kids back, how can they understand these realities and come to know the saving sweet taste of grace unless there are beautiful feet? How beautiful are the feet that bring good news? By the way, beautiful feet are qualified. It's not every foot is beautiful. It's beautiful feet. But only feet that are beautiful are the ones that bring good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. But secondly, let's look at the diagnostic because Paul furthers his argument and says, well, beautiful feet have been sent, at least in before, beautiful feet have been sent. How come the Israelites and how come believers or how can people reject the gospel. Why is it that some people, even when beautiful feet are sent, why is it that some people still reject Jesus? Here's his diagnostic of the problem. Paul shifts and explains why Israel doesn't believe. And by application, he's explaining why people, all people, naturally don't believe, and he explains why they don't believe. But he gives two reasons, and then he rejects them. And he says this, the two reasons that Paul rejects and says, well, people reject Christ, not because they didn't hear about him, because they heard about him. And then the second reason, people reject Christ, not because they didn't understand, they understand the message, but they reject him for another reason. Well, let's look at these first two reasons quickly as to why people reject, don't reject the gospel. He says, well, the first false reason that he debunks is this, verse 18. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed, they have. They have heard. For their voice has gone out to all the earth in their words to the ends of the world. Psalm 19.4. That's what he's quoting from. Psalm 19.4 is basically saying nature declares the glory of God and the nature goes to the ends of the earth. Nature declares everything about God to the ends of the earth. And he takes this same kind of point and says in the same way, the gospel has been gone out, has went out to the ends of the earth. So how can people reject Jesus? It's not because they haven't heard. They have heard the gospel. But a second reason in, in verse 19, well, what's the second reason that Paul rejects? He says, it's not because they didn't understand, but I ask, did Israel not understand? For Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I'll make you angry. And he's quoting Deuteronomy 32.21. This is a little bit more sophisticated, but basically is saying this. God used the Gentile nations, Gentiles who are not my people, Gentiles who were a known nation and not my people, no identity. But even the Gentiles eventually understood the message of the gospel. And Paul's using a lesser to greater argument. is saying if the Gentiles who didn't have Israel's history, if the Gentiles who were a known nation, if the Gentiles weren't my people, they were actually second place and they were engrafted later. If the Gentiles can understand, Israel, how much more do you understand? Because... Israel was my chosen people. My covenant was established with them. They knew the prophecies and the promises much better than the Gentiles' world. And that's why God says, even the Gentiles, who are not part of my people originally, they understand. So how come people reject the gospel? It's not because they didn't hear, nor was it because they don't understand. They reject the gospel because it was a willful, voluntary, autonomous, selfish, sinful rejection. It's important to know the real diagnosis, friends, as harsh as the message is. You know, we often think the gospel is too rigid, so we soften the theology a little bit and say, well, God's a loving God, there's not really any hell. We say the gospel is too boring, so that's why people don't ex accept the gospel. So we try to have seeker-sensitive, sensitive, entertainment-driven church so that we can entertain people into believing in the gospel. Or we say the gospel is too irrelevant, it's too archaic, and so we soften and we never teach or talk about the harder truths of the gospel that speak into the cultural issues of the day, and so we water it down. But those things are not the reason that people accept the gospel. 
they understand it, they hear it. The reason at the end of the day people reject the gospel is because they choose to. As one pastor said, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. The heart chooses to reject Jesus Christ. There's a French mathematician, Blaise Pascal, and he famously came up with what is known as Pascal's wager. And if you don't know what Pascal's wager is, it's basically this wager that he came up with and says, well, if you have two choices to choose God or to reject God, natural, logical, mathematical probability says you should choose God. That's his wager. He's saying, what do you have to lose? If you choose God and he doesn't exist, then you're going to die anyways. But if you don't choose God, but God actually does exist, then you're going to be in some real deep trouble because now you're burning in hell and there's an eternal weight of glory that you missed out on. It's just a natural decision for a non-Christian. Which one should you choose? You know, throw the dice, play the probability. You better just choose God because you have nothing to lose if he doesn't exist. That's Pascal's wager. And people have said that Pascal's wager was an evangelistic tool to rationally convince people that the most mathematically prob probable solution is to choose God. But one of my professors, Carl Truman, says that's not actually the point of Pascal's wager. You know, in other words, Pascal's wager is to show another point about the nature of humanity. He says, actually, Blaise Pascal is trying to expose a human inconsistency because as a mathematician, Pascal noticed that humans make decisions in life based on a percentage game. Humans, Pascal says, calculate the percentage risks involved in various courses of action and choose actions in an attempt to minimize negative risk. So for example, we wait to cross the road until the probability of getting run down is essentially zero. Ask any game theorist and he will tell the same story. Human beings are risk averse. However, despite our claim to rationality in the matters of God, Pascal uses his wager to show that if we were simply playing a percentage game, in the way that we do in the rest of life, everyone would always choose God because that's the most mathematically probable solution. That's your best bet. But most people reject God. You know why? Because it's not a decision of the rationale. It's not because they don't understand. They reject God because it's a moral choice. In their sin, they reject God. In their sin, they want to be autonomous. In their sin, they don't choose what is the right and rational choice. So what is his diagnostic, the Apostle Paul? It's not because they didn't hear. It's not because they don't understand. It's not because it's not a logical reason to choose God. He's saying they don't choose God because they're in sin. It's a moral choice. And that is why beautiful feet bring forth the gospel and say, Jesus has died for your sins. You know, that's the message of the gospel. It's not to say Jesus, he's more fun and entertaining than the world and the carnivals out there and the fairs and the vacations. He doesn't say that. There's a certain truth to that, but that's not how you preach the gospel. You don't preach the gospel and say, you know, the things that you're sensitive about, the things that you're really passionate about, whether it's hard issues of abortion or homosexuality or money or politics, the things that you have strong convictions about, well, the gospel doesn't really want to say anything about that, so let's just put that to a side and water it down. It doesn't do that. It addresses the heart of the issue in this diagnostic and says, because you reject God and I reject God because we are completely depraved and we are sinful, Christ came down to die for your sins. How beautiful are the feet who bring that news. And last but not least, we look at the logic, we look at the diagnostic, but now let's consider the heart and openness. This is the heart of God. Verses 20 to 21. <clears throat> and Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who do not seek me. I have shown myself to those who do not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. What we have here is basically a picture of grace, the heart of God. He says right there in verse 20, I was found by people who weren't looking for me. I have shown myself to those who weren't asking for me. Now, what does God mean? He's saying, the reason people found me and asked for me is because I was the first mover, and out of my grace, I revealed myself to them. I came to them. 
I came down to sinners by sending my son Jesus to die on the cross. It's a picture of grace. And then he turns to Israel once again, but you can apply this to anybody. He says, all day long, I hold out my hand to a disobedient, contrary people. The invitation is always open. My help is always there. I hold out my right hand, but it's a disobedient and contrary people. But God chose to reveal himself. John Murray has once said this. We can't ignore the necessity of personal acceptance and trust. In other words, to grab the hand of God that's always extended out. The lifeboat is no good unless the drowning man gets into it. And no one else can get in for him. He must do it himself. Yet surely he would never say that the hand which seized the lifeboat was his salvation. He could only view it as the means by which he apprehended the proffered safety. God's hand is extended, but yet you can't ignore the necessity of personal acceptance and trust. The lifeboat is no good. God's hand is no good unless someone jumps into the lifeboat or holds on to the hand of God to receive the salvation. Friends, you know the gesture, extending in hand. You know, we know that gesture, even though this was said centuries ago. Today we say, offer helping hand. We know extending a hand is a very significant gesture even for us today, a helping hand. You go up to someone, you ask her, would you like to dance with me? You offer the hand. Aladdin in Disney's famous movie, Aladdin asks Jasmine on the first ride on the magic carpet, he says, do you trust me? And he extends the offered hand. We extend our hands to people we like or want to get to know. We understand what it means. We invite you into myself. I want to have a relationship with you. You extend the hand because you do it to people that you like. But this is why it's a picture of grace. God extends his almighty, all-powerful, all-loving hand to a disobedient and contrary people like you and me. Contrary, that word there is kind of a weird translation. It means sort of rejecting people. It means sort of a contrary, hypocritical people. Contrary is used as an adjective in that verse, but in the Greek, it's actually a verb. It's a participle. And it's saying, basically, this is the nature of humanity apart from God. By nature, you are always living in a contrary manner. There's no neutrality. In other words, our nature, it by, by, apart from the grace of Jesus, we have an anti-God disposition. We are living contrary. It's a participle. That is our nature. That's our activity. It's continuous. It's always going apart from the saving, salvific work of Jesus Christ. But you know what? To contrary people, or if I could use it as a verb, to people who live contrarying, God extends his right hand. Because that's a picture of his love and grace. And we do well to hear the words of John Murray to say we can't ignore the necessity of personal acceptance and trust, but have beautiful feet to offer the right hand of God in this covenantal relationship to be brought into him and to encourage and pray that people will have their eyes opened and accept Jesus Christ. Well, I've been reading a little bit of Pascal, and so as I end this message, I want to offer another insight by him. And Dr. Carl Truman. One of the things that Pascal writes about is this idea of why do kings need jesters? Do you know what jesters are? They're just like, they want colorful, funny clothes. King sits up on his throne. Whenever he wants to be entertained, the jester comes out, does a dance, juggles a couple of balls, tells a few jokes. And he's saying, it's not that entertaining, but why do kings back then need jesters? And this is the analysis. Most people tend to spend their time worrying and working to live, worrying about where money and food will come from. But a king doesn't have to worry about those things. A king doesn't have money and food to occupy his thoughts because he's immensely wealthy. Indeed, if he is left to his own thoughts, what a king naturally thinks about is that he begins to dwell over things such as death, human mortality, the afterlife, things that are a little bit depressing and morbid. And if a king who doesn't have to worry about daily things thinks about deep and morbid thoughts, he's going to go into depression 
or it's going to go crazy. So that's why they have jesters to lighten the mood and to occupy and distract him from thinking about these heavy, morbid, depressing thoughts. That's the purpose of jesters for kings. And what Truman points out is this. It also explains this is why in our culture today, we need our own versions of jesters. We pay so much money to watch football and to watch film stars. Comparatively little to the politicians who run the country, we are subconsciously declaring the truth that we consider entertainment to be much more important than government because it's entertainment that keeps us distracted from my own, our own mortality. And in fact, that's why he thinks in our culture, people are so apathetic to God because we have so many jesters in our life. You know, there are those who say, both Christian and non-Christian, theologians and also sociological and analysts, they, sociologists, they say the greatest problem we have in our day and age in our culture today is not that we have a problem of dysfunction, we have a problem of distraction. How many times have you wa- looked at your phone in this 30-minute message? And that's why we're so apathetic to the hand of God that's been extended. And yet, friends, that is a challenge that we face today in our culture, a world of dysfunction, and yet a world of even deeper distraction, a world in which you and I have jesters all around us, distracting us for the main thing of accepting and grabbing onto, with personal acceptance, faith, and trust, the hand of God given to us in his son, Jesus Christ. So I pray that you and I would have beautiful feet, Wonderfully beautiful feet because we have a wonderful message of reconciliation and peace and love that this world and all its brokenness, as good as it is, cannot give you the hope and trust, security, the comfort, the love that your soul and your heart so desperately needs and so does the world. And we bring this message out there with beautiful feet because we have this glorious, beautiful message of a resurrected Savior who died on the cross for you and me, a resurrected Savior who is a righteous king, the perfect priest, and the most glorious prophet to be in relationship with him and have salvation forever. Friends, as we end Mission this Month, at the end of the day, I pray whether you're three years old, 80 years old, 90, we could all have and put on our most beautiful and attractive feet. Let's pray, friends. Bow your heads with me. Lord, we thank you so much for this time because we, you meet with us and you speak to us and you reveal and show yourself to us in the cross of Jesus. And Lord, Father, we confess that oftentimes in our hearts we do reject Christ and we're so distracted, but Lord, help us to keep the main thing the main thing, first things first, and to share the message of reconciliation, the gospel of Jesus, dying on the cross for us, rising again from the dead. And I pray for anybody who's listening out there, virtually, Lord God, that if they have not accepted the right hand that you offer them in love and grace, that you would work by your spirit to regenerate their hearts, to open their eyes, and to by faith reach out and receive the lifeboat of the cross of Jesus Christ for our drowning sin. So Lord, I pray that you continually do your work and build up your church through the beautiful feet that you give us in this awesome grace to be called a disciple. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.